Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Adam Herman. Today, I'm going to share a talk that I'm giving at the uh, Rocky Mountain Guidance Navigation and Controls Conference titled Reinforcement Learning for Multi-Satellite Agile EOS Scheduling under Various Communication Assumptions. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Hans-Peter Schaub, as well as my co-author, Mark Stevenson, uh, who implemented the communication assumptions in this work and ran all the benchmarks. Um, I'd also like to thank the NASA Space Technology Graduate Research Opportunity um, and the Air Force Research Lab for partially funding this work. So a quick overview of the presentation, I'm gonna discuss the motivation behind the work, then the multi-sat Earth observing scheduling problem that we formulated. I'll then get into our training and deployment pipeline and finally end with some of our results and the conclusions and future work. So motivation. Um, today, I'm talking primarily about spacecraft planning and scheduling, which is really just computing the sequence of commands that a spacecraft must execute to fulfill high-level science and mission objectives. Uh, so traditionally, planning and scheduling is a ground-based process where uh, execution is open loop on board the spacecraft. So you have some iteration during mission design between science and mission planning. Um, the outputs from that process, though, like your science objectives, trajectory of the spacecraft, the specification of the spacecraft, are then usually passed to an activity planning block during operations, where you have some activity planning software that's trying to compute a sequence of actions that the spacecraft needs to execute, right? So here's an example where first you have to heat an instrument, uh, then point that instrument at a target, and then finally uh, command that an image is taken with the instrument. Uh, this activity plan is uh, usually taken and input into a sequencing software, which just generates the low-level commands that are then uplinked and executed open loop on board the spacecraft. Um, the primary challenge with this, though, is that it's not robust to opportunistic science events or misground contacts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, typically, this is addressed with onboard replanning capabilities. So if you think of like JPL's Casper system, that's one way that this can be handled. Uh, you can also kind of bake stochasticity into your problem formulation, uh, but that's non-trivial. And I've usually only seen it address kind of one of these uh, different issues that I've listed above. Um, Agent-based decision-making actually can kind of inherently address some of these issues though. Um, so how does agent-based decision-making kind of change the, the planning and scheduling paradigm? Well, it looks largely the same uh, with a few modifications, right? So you might replace your training block or sorry, your activity planning block with a training block. You'd then uplink your policy to the spacecraft. And then that policy is executed closed loop based on observations from the environment. Um, so there are a couple different ways that you can implement agent-based decision-making. Uh, probably the most popular would be reinforcement learning. Uh, reinforcement learning is basically just learning how to map states to actions to maximize some numerical reward signal. And really what we're concerned with solving for is some policy pi that will map the states to actions. This policy can be represented in tabular form, uh, but most popularly, it's represented with a neural network. So here's the formal objective of, of some RL problem, right? We're trying to select the policy that maximizes the expected uh, value of the sum of all future reward. Um, and this is for a finite horizon problem. So there's no um, discounting of the rewards. Uh, so our primary motivation for using RL for spacecraft planning um, is that we can generate optimal planning solutions uh, in just milliseconds on board the spacecraft in response to the actual state of the environment. Right? So if you get a new science opportunity, your closed loop planning process will just automatically handle that for you, provided that you've trained everything correctly. Uh, so if you're solving an RL problem, though, you need to formulate it as a Markov decision process. Uh, so let's say you have some decision decision making agent in some state S naught. It then selects an action uh, based on that state following its policy pi. Uh, the action is then taken, and the agent transitions to a new state S one and receives a reward signal. And then that process continues until well out to infinity or the end of your planning horizon or some other terminal state that you might reach. Uh, but things get a little bit more challenging when you go from an MDP, which is for one decision-making agent, uh, to multiple decision-making agents, right? So 
And I'm going to briefly talk about multi-agent deep RL for multi-sat scheduling. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can formulate the problem. Here are a couple. Uh, you could use a decentralized POMDP, which is probably the most general and makes the fewest assumptions about what kind of communication you have between the agents. Um, if you have free communication, you could formulate a multi-agent MDP and kind of solve some of your issues. But at the end of the day, your primary challenge is going to be solve time because your action space is now exponential in the number of agents, right? And I can tell you from, from my experience with just solving single agent MDPs for spacecraft planning and scheduling, this would take a significant amount of time. It's non-trivial. Um, so there's a couple of research questions that we want to uh, answer to kind of address these challenges, right? So first and foremost, uh, can you train a single agent and a single agent MDP to act as a part uh, uh, in, in a multi-agent environment? So, so can you do that? And, and what happens to your performance when you do that, right? So in that instance, you would be maximizing the local reward of each agent as opposed to the global reward. Um, and so you can kind of think of the decision-making agents then as competing uh, for, for reward instead of coordinating to maximize it across for everybody, right? Um, but if, if you do it this way, you don't really have to make any constraints or assumptions on the design of your constellation. You can scale it up or down, um, and it doesn't really change much because you trained in an environment that assumed just one agent. Um, another thing that we want to look at is, you know, how do our communication assumptions, once we've done this, uh, impact performance, uh, impact things like duplication of efforts between agents? Um, and then how does this problem formulation compare to one in which the agents are coordinating to maximize global reward? So now I'll talk briefly about the problem statement. So let's say you have some uh, small sat constellation that's getting tasked by some larger satellite that's basically just sending a target request like requests and saying like, hey, you know, I, I saw something interesting here. Will you take a look at it, right? And the agents have to kind of dynamically respond to these requests and fulfill them uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so to kind of state this formally, we have a, a constellation of K satellites in LEO that are attempting to locally maximize the weighted sum of targets imaged and downlinked while avoiding resource constraint violations like draining the battery, exceeding maximum wheel speeds, or overfilling the data buffer. Uh, so we have some global set of targets, M, um, that can be changed. Um, each of those targets has a priority of one through three. Each spacecraft has a local set of targets, T sub K, that is determined based on um, when the spacecraft have access to the global targets, if ever. Um, so it's a subset of M. And then each spacecraft also has an uh, an upcoming set of targets, right? So this is the next, uh, these are the next J targets that the spacecraft is going to see along its flight path. Uh, so the local target set T sub K after every decision-making interval is updated with communication between spacecraft. Um, and then as the spacecraft image targets, they downlink them to seven different ground stations located on the surface of the earth. And that downlink is you know, based on access to those ground stations. Uh, there are several actions that each uh, spacecraft can take, right? So there's a, a charging mode where the spacecraft points at solar panels at the sun to collect charge. We also have desaturation, downlink, and then imaging for each one of those targets in you. So that's kind of how we, we formulate our action space. I'm gonna skip past the state space um, and just go right to the reward function and, and kind of talk about it abstractly, right? So. We give each decision-making agent a very small bonus for imaging an unimaged target. We give a relatively large bonus uh, for downlinking a target that's not been downlinked before. And we also return a large penalty for failure. And basically, we've kind of tuned the reward function such, such that the minimum cumulative reward is negative one, and the maximum cumulative reward is plus one. That way, we're fairly well numerically can get conditioned. Um, so now I'll quickly talk about what different communication assumptions we implemented for this work. Um, it's basically, at the end of each step through the environment, the spacecraft kind of update their local target set based on the following rules, right? So we go from little communication to a lot of communication. So let's start with, with the no communications uh, case. As, as it sounds, we, there are no communication, right? The spacecraft do not communicate to update their information. So there's a lot of duplication of efforts, right? Which is what you would expect, right? They're not communicating. They're gonna keep imaging the same high priority targets. 
Um, we also implement a single degree line of sight communication. So basically spacecraft A will update um, its target list if it has line of sight uh, to spacecraft B, right? But if spacecraft B has line of sight to spacecraft C, uh, spacecraft A is not going to receive that information, right? Spacecraft A would still have to be in communication with C. Uh, Multi-degree line of sight kind of takes that one step further. So those three spacecraft in that chain that I kind of mentioned would all kind of come to a consensus on what's been imaged and what's been downlinked so far. Uh, and then the last case is free communication, right? So at every time step, all spacecraft kind of communicate with one another to come to a consensus on what they've imaged and what they've downlinked. Okay, on to methods. Um, so training and deployment, as I mentioned, we formulate a single SAT training environment. Uh, and this training environment is representative of the multi-SAT scenario, right? So kind of same type of orbits, exact same spacecraft specification, ground stations are in the same location, but there's just one spacecraft instead of many, right? And then we're operating over a three orbit planning horizon. The training process, we, we use an algorithm that I call MCTS train. Uh, it's like alpha zero, if you're familiar with that, but it's far simpler. Um, so we basically just generate approximations of the state action value function with Monte Carlo tree search, um, and then apply supervised learning over those estimates to get a policy out, right? And so then we take those trained policies and we kind of upload one on every single spacecraft, right? So each spacecraft has its own version of the policy and its own set of targets. Um, and we also wrap a safety shield around each of those policies, right? So every time the decision-making agent wants to take an action, that action is basically just evaluated as to whether or not it's safe, right? So, you know, are we going to try to do a very power intensive thing like downlink when our batteries are getting a little bit low? Uh, if so, the shield policy will override that and say, no, 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 take the safe action instead. So we use this in training, um, but we also use it in deployment just to make sure that we're we're safe and, and we're robust. So now I'll, I'll talk quickly about the simulation environment. So from the AVS lab, um, I obviously love Basilisk. That's what I'm using for the sim. Uh, so Basilisk, if you're unfamiliar with it, is a high fidelity astrodynamic software framework, but it's also a lot more than that. I mean, we've been using it for effectively mission planning um, with, with this RL work. Uh, so we model various subsystems like attitude control, power, onboard data handling, ground stations, and all of these things kind of interact, interact with one another. There's dependency on the attitude of the spacecraft, uh, your reaction wheels consume power. The power generation is based on your incidence angle with the sun, which is dependent on what you're pointing at at, at that time. So it's a very complex, but very realistic sim. Uh, and we take the simulation and we wrap it in what's known as a gym environment, right? So basically the agent passes an action to gym. It will turn different models on or off in Basilisk um, and then return rewards and observations uh, back to the agent, right? So. That's how that works. Uh, here are the repositories. If you're interested in looking at them, um, don't forget if you don't get them right now, they'll be at the, the last slide as well. Okay, so now I'll talk quickly about the results. Um, we did experiments for a single plane case for a Walker Delta constellation. Um, we also did some multi-plane experiments. I'm not gonna show those here. They're in the paper if you're interested, uh, but I wanted to leave them out because the results are somewhat similar and I wanted to avoid duplication for the sake of brevity. Okay, so onto the single plane experiments. Um, so how do we set this up? Well, we have um, N spacecraft in a in orbits with a 500 kilometer altitude um, at a 45 degree inclination in one plane. Um, we also know that we'll have some critical number of satellites where line of sight communication is possible. Um, so we've computed that um, to be 9.2 satellites. Uh, that assumes, uh, of course, that there's kind of an extra buffer zone above the Earth of about 100 kilometers, um, but 9.2 satellites, right? But you can't have fractional satellites, so let's kind of go through this. Um, so for n less than n star, line of sight communication should match no communication, right? Effectively, they, they never have line of sight. They should never be communicating, right? So if we have nine or fewer satellites, no comms, right? If we have more than nine satellites, so, so 10 or more, um, line of sight communication should match free communication because they'll always be within the line of sight of one another, right? Um, so 
let's kind of examine these results and make sure that the experimental results kind of align with our intuition here. Uh, so what I'm plotting here is local reward or reward per satellite versus the global number of targets and number of sats. So we've got a, a handy legend up there. Uh, the line styles basically dictate which communication model we're using, um, and the colors represent um, the different numbers of satellites. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a 2D view. On the right-hand side, we have the corresponding three-dimensional view. Um, and so kind of let's let's talk about n less than n star, right? So that's going to be over here, the blue line and the orange line. Uh, so we should see our line of sight communication cases basically matching the no communication case, uh, which we do see, right? So you can see three comms all the way up here, and then the other three kind of collapse on one another. Uh, but the moment that we cross over n star and get n equal 10 satellites, we should see uh, the line of sight comms kind of match free communication, right? Which we do see, right? So this green line starting here and then all the way down. Um, a couple of other things that I'd like to note on this plot. Um, so as we increase the number of satellites, you'll notice that the uh, local reward uh, decreases, right? So the reward per satellite decreases. And the reason for that is because the satellites are in you know, more and more competition with one another to collect um, high priority targets, right? Uh, so the more satellites you have, the more competition there is. Um, and since they're not coordinating with one another to maximize global reward, you do see a decrease, right? I should mention, and I don't show this here, that your global reward increases, which makes sense. I mean, you know, have more satellites, they're going to collect more targets, right? And so um, all of this is matching our intuition and, and what kind of what our analytical results would suggest. Um, another thing we can look at um, are the numbers of uh, unique downlink targets, right? Um, so what we would expect is that if, if we have few spacecraft that are always in communication with one another, we almost never duplicate targets, right? First and foremost, they're usually never over the same target. Um, and secondly, they're always able to communicate hey, you know, I've taken that target that you're going to get in the next few windows, right? And so we can see that here, right? So for the free communication case for a few satellites, we get about, you know, a ratio of one. Uh, so so, so almost every target that's downlinked is unique. Um, for no communication, if you look down here, it's far worse, right? There's a lot more duplication, uh, but that's to be expected. Um, and then, you know, line of sight and everything else kind of, uh, it's as you would expect, basically. Okay, so uh, those were some of the preliminary results. I, I, I'll just mention once again, we have uh, a whole set of multi-plane experiments, both at the end of this presentation and in the paper. So please take a look at those um, if you're interested. They match pretty closely with the single plane, but it's still interesting. Um, so can you train an agent in an MDP to act uh, in a multi-agent environment? Yes, you can definitely do that. I mean, we knew the answer was yes before running these experiments, but we did it, so yes. Um, how do various communication assumptions impact performance? Uh, well, so in general, free communication is the best. That makes sense. No communication performs the worst and line of sight is somewhere in between. Um, however, the performance of the line of sight communication really depends on the constellation design um, and the total number of targets, right? So are we above or below N star or in the case where we're looking at a multi-plane case, P star? Uh, and then three, how does this compare to a formulation that maximizes global reward as opposed to local rewards? Uh, well, that is the subject of future work. It's actually something I'm working on this week. Um, and we hope to have some interesting results on that so that we can really understand if you were to formulate a decentralized POM DP and solve it, how much performance are we leaving on the table with, with our current formulation? And, and is it worth doing that? So that's kind of what we, what we want to figure out. Uh, with that, um, if you have any questions, uh, please shoot me an email. And as I stated before, here are the repositories for Basilisk, uh, but also the gym interface that we use to wrap Basilisk for this work. So thank you. Uh, thank you for watching.